When Britain was at war, Canada was also at war automatically, but Canadians would determine the extent of their own commitment. Great Britain, which had long pledged to defend Belgium's sovereignty, issued an ultimatum to Germany on 4th of August 1914, demanding the withdrawal of German troops. When the ultimatum expired at midnight without a German retreat, Great Britain and Germany were at war. So too was the British Empire. Our story begins at Bramshot Camp near Hazelmere in the southeast of England. The Canadian forces, part of the British Commonwealth, spent much of their time at Bramshot Camp before they got sent off to France to fight German forces. In this scene of Flora's Peveril, a British corporal is attempting to train two Canadian soldiers, Jim and Lem, the art of throwing Mills bombs, a type of hand grenade. Now then! Training! Johnson! What do you am holding in my hands? Looks like an old tin filled with nuts and bolts, Corporal. Does it? Indeed. Let me tell you. This represents a Mills bomb. Y you know what a Mills bomb is, don't you? You throw it at the enemy? You do, soldier. And as far away from you and you as possible. When this hits the ground, it will go, go what a bang! And you want to be as far away as if it's as possible. I'll bet. Due to the mayhem and destruction this thing can cause, we are not going to use the real thing. As Johnson rightly told me, we use an old tin filled with nuts and bolts. Word on, Jim. It comes from a wasted childhood, Len. As luck will have it, this is the same weight and size as the real thing. And on command of fire, not now, you will bowl your tin into the hole over there. Uh huh? Bowl, Corporal? Uh, how's that again, Corporal? Sort of. Sorry, you mean? Gordon Bennett, I've got to teach you Canadians the ins and outs of cricket as well. It's a fly on the wall at 30 yards. Yeah, Fritz! Won't we just a fly on the wall? They will be buried down in trenches. So, you have to throw your grenade in an arc so that it comes in from above. Is that crystal? <laughs> I guess we don't play much cricket in Winnipeg, eh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not funny. But <laughs> The Mills bomb was designed in 1915 and was used from 1915 to the 1980s. It was a classic design, a grooved cast iron with a central striker held by a closed hand lever and secured with a pin. The casing was grooved to make it easier to grip and not to aid as a fragmentation. The Mills was a defensive grenade. After throwing, the user had to take cover immediately. A common tent thrower could manage 15 metres with reasonable accuracy, but the grenade could throw lethal fragments further than this. The British Home Guard was instructed that throwing grenade number 36 was about 27.5 metres with a danger area of about 100 yards. On fire! Oi! You're in the firing range! I'm sorry. You didn't tell us Fritz was a female corporal, sir. It's right, man. We're only throwing jamtons today. The real thing's tomorrow. All right, all right. I'll get a change. You escort her off. Say, I need the village postmistress. Bit off your route today. I was walking home from the pond. Must have been daydreaming. Real nice countryside out here. 
I was writing to my folks about it just the other day. Where's home? Near Winnipeg. Do you know Canada? No, I don't, but my brother was there for a while. He was? Whereabouts? In Ontario, until the war started. He's over here now, then? He was. You mean... Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I was daydreaming about. I've just been to the place I was working when he was in the Boer War. He came back from that one. Say, so, when we get over there, we'll give the Fritz one for your brother. I hope the whole thing's over before you have to. Anyway, you can go from here, man. We'll get back to our tin cans. Thank you, and I'm sorry I interrupted your training. For us, it's been a privilege to meet you. And remember us to Posty. I shall. Off we go! When we think about war, we think about soldiers. And we think about fighting, and we think about explosions, and we think about allies and enemies. We don't, however, stop and consider the little, often unnoticed stories that never get much attention. We don't often think about the small stories behind the big stories. Like, for example, the little lady who used to wash all of the soldiers' laundry after a hard, sweaty day's training. That sweet little lady on the screen used to load all of the fellas' filthy laundry into an old pram and cut it several miles up Warmer Hill from Bramshot Camp to her home on Lion Green. And the only person she could talk to along the way was herself. All right, baby's in the pram. I can hardly see her from all this washing. Come on, you three. We need to get going. Else those Canadian soldiers will be moaning they've got no clean uniforms. Now stop your arguing and come on. It's a long way, and we need to be on our way. God, blimey, this hill's a killer. Come on. I know it's hard work, but at least you don't have to push a heavy pram. Where's your brother gone? Come on, stop messing. It's all right for some, and I know my husband's off fighting for king and country, but I'd wish he'd just send some money home. How am I meant to bring up four kids and no man around the place? Just as well we've got Canadians here. At least they're doing washing and brings a couple of shillings or... I don't know what to do. Just wish you weren't too far to take it all. It ain't easy for these four and tow. Blimey, you've been training. You're filthy. Well, here's the green shirts. Just get the dirty ones over and I'll be off. Well, good luck to you all. And if you see that husband of mine, tell him it's time he sent the king's shilling home to fed his wife and kids. Now, where are those children? Come on, it'll be dark by the time we get home. After their training, the soldiers stationed at Bramshot Camp were often made to march to Liphook Railway Station near Hazelmere and wait there for long periods of time, often on a hot summer's day. You can imagine how thirsty the lads would have been. It was just as well that the Winter family, who lived in the railway cottage at Liphook Station, gave the boys the refreshments they needed. The year is 1918. George Winter, employee of London and South Western Railway Company, has arrived home from work to meet his wife and son. Welcome home, honey. How was work? Not bad. Weather's good today. Yeah, it's one of the hottest days this year, apparently. Work's not bad at the moment. Had to go to London to get some supplies. Hello, Father. Now that you're home, can we make some lemonade for the Canadian soldiers? Apparently they're coming down to Liphook Station tomorrow morning. Son, that sounds like a splendid idea. However, I need to get some rest, but I'm sure your mother would be only too happy to meet some Canadian soldiers. I was over the moon that my mum would help me, so I rushed back to pick out some lemons and put the kettle on ready. See you in the morning, son. Night, love. We made the lemonade by pouring the boiling water over the cut-up lemons. After, we put the lemonade in the larger to cool. In the morning, we took it down to the station for the soldiers. This is delicious, boy. Yeah, real top quality. How much do we owe you? Nothing, it's free, sir. We can't let him go with nothing, can we, John? No, we can't, can we, Lawrence? Do you collect badges? No, I don't. Well, you have to start from somewhere, don't you? Guess so. Here you are. Thanks. Keep making the lemonade. It's perfect. 
The First World War touched every small town and every family in Canada. But the Bowes family had more than its share of suffering. All three of the Bowes brothers, one of whom you can see in a hospital bed, enlisted in the war and throughout their service wrote letters faithfully home to their mother Margaret and their little sister Evelyn, and she, in turn, sent letters and parcels back. Clifford was the first to enlist, and he went off to England for further training. His two brothers, Jim and Fred, also enlisted. The following are excerpts from some of the letters Clifford wrote at Bramshot Camp. April 6, 1916, Bramshot Military Hospital, England. My dearest mother, your lovely letter of March 16th arrived yesterday. Could not help but laugh at you thinking we were all in France. The only ones that are there in France are the drafts we sent, about half of the battalion, but Jim and I are still here and me in bed to boot. Although I am allowed up every afternoon for a while, I am feeling somewhat better, but far from well, and it will be months before I get to the front at any rate. I am real glad Jim and Fred like the training so much. It's a good life, but I got used up and wouldn't give in to it till they made me, and now I've been off parade for two months exactly. A bunch of the boys are up twice a week to see me. <laughs> I don't know whether it's me they want to see or the nurse. Well, I have to close now, as we don't get much news around the hospital. Your loving son, Cliff. April 16th, 1916, Bramshot Military Hospital, England. My dear mother, I am sorry my letters are so short and miserable, but since I have been in the hospital, I can't seem to set my mind to write a good, newsy letter. But I guess the trouble is I, I don't see much to write about. This sure is a novelty, me lying in bed with a thermometer in my mouth and trying to write. I had to stop writing for a while as I had to undergo 15 minutes of daily agony while they were dressing my hip. Elliot knows what a good-sized abscess, about the size of your head, is like to dress. It nearly makes you sing, Nearer, my God, to thee, when they jump that pure peroxide into it. Oh, it's so lovely. Well, the 44th are all in France now, all but our section and signalers, and I'm afraid our bunch will be away before I can stand to carry an 80-pound pack all day. But I am hoping for the best. It's ten weeks tomorrow since I went sick, so you can imagine I'm not as strong as I have been. There were only a few days that I was between our brigade hospital and this one, and then all I'd done was write letters and lie about. I'm sure glad you're not worrying too much about me, as I am in the best place I could possibly be, and they sure try to get the boys fit. Eventually, the two younger boys got to England, but before they could meet up with Clifford, he was sent off to France. It was only somewhere in France that the three boys had a chance to meet up, and although the letters do not exactly reveal where they were, we now know that they were all together at Vimley Ridge during the months of planning for the battle, which began on April 9th, 1917. The happy reunion ended on February 28th when a single grenade exploded among the group of four soldiers, including the two younger Bose brothers. Jim died of his wounds that day, but Fred was taken to hospital, where he too eventually succumbed to his wounds. Clifford, we learn, died on the front line. Although he was buried near where he fell, his grave was lost in the turmoil of further fighting. Today, Clifford's name is carved into the Menham Gate in Ypres, Belgium, along with 45,000 other Commonwealth soldiers who are buried there but have no known grave. Many Canadian soldiers made the trip safely from Canada to England and, after training, on to France to fight in the trenches. Their voyage was made all the more safer by the majestic vessel RMS Olympic. Let's hear a little bit more about Old Reliable, as she was also known. The RMS Olympic was the first of three similar sister ships that include the Titanic and the Britannic. The Olympic was built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast and launched as RMS Olympic in 1910, a year earlier than the Titanic, with her main voyage taking place in 1911. As the newest and largest of the transatlantic liners, Olympic was described with all the superlatives later applied to Titanic. Ocean Greyhound, finest steamer afloat, largest vessel in the world and queen of the ocean. 
When the Olympic arrived in Liverpool on the 11th of April, the 61st Battalion boarded trains for their camps in Bramshaw, Hampshire. It was a place that was to be home to countless Canadian soldiers in both the First and Second World Wars. Able to accommodate close to 6,000 troops at a time, Olympic made 10 round trips from Liverpool to Halifax between March and December 1916. On the return voyages, she carried wounded soldiers and civilians back to Canada. For the next two years, Olympic continued to ferry Canadian and American troops across the Atlantic, and in 1919 brought the victorious soldiers home. Although she was once a household name in Canada, Olympic's wartime service has since slipped into obscurity. While the war had many casualties, not all of the casualties died, and those that survived their injuries did so because of the dedicated doctors and nurses up and down the country. One such nurse was Sister Agnes Forneri, based at the number 12 hospital in Bramshot, who cared for many of the Canadian troops, nursing them and their injuries back to full health, or as much health as possible. Despite her efforts, many of the Canadian troops died of influenza, or Spanish flu, as it is more commonly known, and sadly, Nurse Agnes herself died from the same world epidemic and passed away on April 24, 1918, aged only 39. A global killer. The Spanish influenza epidemic, uniquely lethal in attacking young, healthy bodies, killed at least 20 million people worldwide, including an estimated 50,000 Canadians. The flu was spread through bodily fluids and moved quickly through the population. The flu presented itself through fatigue and cough, but quickly attacked the body, creating mucus buildup in the lungs that could not be expelled. Victims of the flu could be dead within a day of contracting the illness. The flu in Canada. Canada's flu dead included soldiers who had survived the fight overseas only to succumb to illness once in Canada, and thousands of family members who welcomed them home but perished soon after their arrival. The loss of so many Canadians had a profound social and economic impact on the country that had already suffered 60,000 war dead. The combined death toll significantly reduced the workforce. It left thousands of families without a primary wage earner and orphaned thousands of children. Today, the Canadians that fell are remembered each year, both in Bramshot and in Canada. Ceremonies take place on both sides of the Atlantic to mark and honour the efforts of the Canadian troops. Britain had opened a 630-bed hospital at a camp which was later taken over by the Canadians. On the 12th of October 1917, it became number 12 Canadian General Hospital. It was mainly for camp sick, but also treated over a thousand battle casualties. Those that died were mainly buried at Bramshot Church, with Catholic soldiers being buried at St. Joseph's Church, Greyshot. Mortality was low until September 1918, averaging less than four per month. However, this grew steadily with the flu pandemic and a total of 348 Canadians are buried in the churchyard. In due course, the War Graves Commission placed headstones on the graves. The War Cross, which stands in the main group of Canadian graves, was dedicated on Sunday the 24th of April 1921. During the war, some battalions laid up their colours in Bramshot Church when they left for France, and later collected them after the armistice. This tradition continued with the Canadian flags flying at the back of the church today. These include the camp flag that flew over Camp Huron until it was taken down in 1947 and presented to the church on Canada Day which is held every year on July the 1st. The links between the Canadians and the church have continued to this day. In 1945, Canadians raised money for stained glass windows de depicting the different Canadian provinces, and in 1954, Canadian veterans and well-wishers made a further gift in memory of their dead by presenting the church with a canopied stool, a desk and a lectern. These were dedicated at the Canada Day Service. 
In 1986, Neo's made by local people with emblems of Canada and its provinces were also dedicated. The province of Newfoundland is not included in the Canadian windows as it is not a province until 1949. So to have a presence in the church, the War Veterans Association of Newfoundland presented a Bible to the church in 1988. Over the years, the church has always had a Canada Day service. This used to be the closest Sunday and was celebrated by both locals and Canadian war veterans. Local ladies would put flowers and poppies on their graves. With veterans becoming fewer and fewer, the service is now on Wednesday following Canada Day. The service includes the Year 4 pupils from Lippert School. The pupils learn about the Canadians and link to the Bram shop prior to the service. During the service, which is still attended by Canadian officials and veterans association, the pupils read pieces they have written commemorating the Canadian soldiers and also sing the Canadian national anthem. Flags are paraded during the service, and following the service are paraded to the graveyard, where wreaths are laid at the war cross, and the year four school children place Canadian flags and maple leaves they have made on the graves. So, the cruel irony of World War I is that while many lost their lives on the battlefield, many more, including countless Canadians, died of Spanish influenza after their return home. But the fact remains that without their efforts, the freedoms that we enjoy in the Commonwealth and indeed the Western world may have forever been jeopardized. It is imperative, therefore, that this significant, poignant time in history must never be forgotten, so that this story lives on forever.